It's funny how much drama is in the chess oh, world. Oh, man. It's, it's kind of crazy. We don't got to get into it's it. It's D-Rama. I'm just saying. D-Rama. It's like, yeah. wow, it's kind of like, it's like the Kardashians. Of like, yeah, you know, we like don't chess. have to get into it. But this year, there was a massive cheating scandal. Yours truly is being sued for $100 million, right? There was a, there was a... <laughs> Massive amount of drama in the Twitch streaming community over the last couple of years with copyright strikes and infighting. And if you want to dive into the world that is the international governing body, they are FIDE. They are full of controversies and weird stories. And the chess world is due its own kind of like documentary and like, you know, like drive to survive. We are working on bringing this stuff to light because I think one, the stories are fascinating. The people are fascinating. We want to break down stereotypes. If you, you know, chess has been old, slow and white, and we want to prove that chess is young. Young, fun, and diverse as fuck. What's up, guys? It's Logic. Hey, what's up, guys? What's up? What's up, guys? It's Logic. Are you all hear me? Is this what you want? Hey, what's up, guys? <laughs> Welcome to Logically Speaking. Um, I'm your host, Logic. And yeah. I started a podcast. Here we are. <laughs> it's great. Um, our guest today is an incredible man, uh, amazing friend, father of four, husband, self-made millionaire, real gentleman. I mean, just one of the kindest people I've ever met in my life has one hell of a story. Um, co-founder of chess.com. Daniel Wrench, welcome. Wow, that was that was quite the intro, man. Really, so, I just winged it. <laughs> that was that was amazing, and right and right back at you. I'm uh, I'm honored to be here with a friend and one of the people who has been uh, a surprisingly just because we only met a few years ago. That's why I say it's surprising, but just an absolutely critical part of my life ever since you came into it. Dude, and that's so I'm sweet. On, I'm on a journey, and and. I'm so grateful for your generosity and your kindness. And I can't wait to tell some stories about it. Wow, man. Well, that, that means a lot to me and, uh, and you mean a lot to me. And it's funny cause I feel like you're one of those guys, like, you know, when you're a kid and, and you know, you have a friend and maybe you, you, you don't see them often. You like go to stay at your grandma's house mm -hmm. or something. And it's like every summer you go tight beat. I'm just giving you a, an example. Um, and every time you guys reconnect, it's like you never stopped hanging out. Yeah, it's that's, so weird. That's how I feel about you. I, and I feel like, and I don't know how to explain that, but I feel like it's like a kindred spirits thing from the day we met. Yeah. Like the, so B Bobby's a big chess guy for those who don't know. Sorry for taking over Logic's podcast. No, but this Bobby's is why a, you're here. Bobby's a big chess guy. And we met because you were into chess. Yep. And, but it was probably only the second or third like time we got together. We were, I was kind of like helping you out. We were doing some training, right? Yeah. And I, I don't, you remember this call as vividly as I do, but what I remember about it was like, it was the third call and you just opened up and just said, Hey man, like you ever struggle with depression? And I was like, uh, yeah. Like anxiety, depression, all kinds of like trauma, working through shit all the time. And we just ended up talking for like an hour about not you remember that Yeah, because I was so like, anxious actually. And this was, it's funny that you say that. Cause that was one of those really good moments in my life. Like my whole life I've always felt, um, especially as a musician, like you have to do it. like whatever you're doing, like you have to do it. If you're in a meeting, you have to take the meeting. Mm -hmm. Like it is what it is. Like everything always felt so dire. And sometimes, you know, if I was tired or overworked, I was scared Mm -hmm. to push something back or uh, out of fear of, of looking unprofessional or this or that or whatever. So, you know, when me and you were doing these awesome chess lessons, um, there was just something in me that day that was like, you know what, like, I don't want to do this right now, but I yeah. really, I just want to be open and vulnerable about it. And that's when I was like, yeah, man, like I've been kind of bad at going through some stuff and I'm really anxious right now. Like, do you ever feel that? And you said, yeah. And then yes, we just literally, I mean, we must've, we definitely talked way longer than this, than the, than the lesson. Yeah. Or been. whatever the chess lesson was yeah, going to yeah. be. So. No, I, I remember that. And it meant a lot to me to, uh, just that this, you opened up like that, because I think that similar to me, like not, not to your level, you're obviously, you've obviously performed in front of, you know, millions of people and that stuff. But I've, I've also been a performer, right. Been on camera for, for a sure. lot of people a lot. And I've, had moments that people don't know about where I 
was struggling with anxiety. Like I remember one time having like a panic attack in the middle of a show. Wow. And like I was under the lights and I couldn't do anything about it. And I and I generally had, you know, had a hard time just like letting my guard down when I'm supposed to be on. And in that world, like I was supposed to be on because you were getting knowledge from me for sure. But I was the one anxious. Right. So you opened up and then I opened up. And then the funny thing about our relationship is ever since then, it's been like, Oh, like, like we're bros and we don't even know how we got here. And then you and I were both moving to Utah unknown to each other. That was crazy, which is wild at the same time. And you were uh, just a city over, Yeah, which is crazy. Yeah. I, Man, I think about that and it's a, it, like I have been in an arena on stage. Yeah. I've been in like Berlin and Germany, like having a panic attack, like throwing up on the side of the stage just because I've like grinded myself into the earth. You know, I remember that a lot of my career, man, especially as a musician is so there's just, the show must go on. You know what I mean? Yep. And it's like, yeah, but to what extent? Like not at the extent of, of your physical and mental health, like for real. But at the same time, you got to grind though. Yeah, you got to do it. You know, you can't be 21 and it's like your first album and you're on tour and you're like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do Like you got you <laughs> right. to do it. Like right. you, you got it or, or else it's, it's just not going to work out. So I think sometimes we find ourselves in very difficult situations. Um, and I think there is a time to press forward, but I think there also is a time to say no. And for a long, long time, it was difficult for me to use that word. Yeah. So I still don't know that I, I use it as, <laughs> as well as, or as often as I should, but I, I'm working on a lot of this right now. And it's, I mean, still it's like, an, you know, mental health is a, I like to say it's, it's a verb, not a, not a noun like love, right? It's like mental health is something you do. It's yeah. not a thing you attain and then you get to walk away from, right? So like I'm working on this all the time. A guy I'm working with right now, who's kind of an executive coach, I call him like my, my, my business guru. He tells me a lot to watch my breath mm. and that my breath is like revealing to me about whether I'm letting myself get anxious or whether I'm letting myself get affected by things that aren't present Mm. because you start to get like anxiety when you're breathing heavy, which can, which can also happen. It can happen both when you're like nervous, but also happen when you're getting overly exerted, like you should calm down. Right. And I think sometimes we think of, we think of the bad part of anxiety on like the, the times when we know we're overwhelmed, frustrated or struggling, but we don't always recognize when we're letting ourselves get overly excited, overly anxious and overly exerted. And it actually is the same kind of challenge. I agree. It's, it's, um, like I was talking to my engineer the other day and I was like, I, I had this like allergic reaction that I don't think has anything to do with stress or no, I was talking to my buddy, Andy Hall, who's a singer from Manchester orchestra. Okay. And he was like, cause I told him that my hands were itchy and whatever. And he was like, yeah, that's actually happened to me. And I thought it was an allergic reaction, but it was stress. And I was like, but I feel great. I was like, I'm, I feel good. I feel like I have a good balance on home life and, and music and this and that. And he goes, bro, stress doesn't always have to be negative. You right. could just have a lot going on. Right. So I agree with that. But, um, question, where did you grow up? My, <laughs> Um, so I grew up in Arizona, um, uh, a small town in Arizona called Tonto village. Um, it's actually, um, so I was born in Mesa, Arizona, um, East Valley, shout out, shout out to East Valley people. Um, but then I grew up in a small town in Arizona and one of the interesting things about my life, um, and you know, We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it as much as we want to, but, um, I, I grew up in a, in a commune, a community, a collective that some people might say was a cult. Um, and it's one of the reasons I'm currently writing a book right now is not just the story of chess.com, but the story of kind of my childhood and, and the, um, the traumatic things. I mean, there's a reason I'm writing the book and, and, and I'm writing it. This guy's going to be the guy to blame. I'm going to tell that story in a minute as far as why I'm doing it. But, um, but yeah, so I grew up in a very, very small commune that, um, had some cultish, had some cultish issues and I went through a lot of stuff and I, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting story. And I'm excited for the world to really dig into that. You know, I yep. think, I think this, um, you know, interview here is more so kind of like, I just want to dip our toes in it a little, you know, because there's, there's so much to be said in the book. Um, 
And I know that it's absolutely incredible. Um, and I don't want to give too much away cause I want to have you back and really dive into it, especially if, after I've read things in depth, cause you've, you've gone into, to a lot, um, you know, about, uh, molestation and, um, you know, just kind of being alone as a child, which is something that I relate to myself. Yeah. Um, and it can be very difficult, but I, I, I will say that out of the quote unquote cult, if that's how you want to put it is, um, something really special came out of that. That's didn't, is that's how you met your wife, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, and it's, uh, it's kind of my view, I would say, not just about the experience of, of being raised in, in, a, in a cult, but I guess life. I mean, I kind of like look at it, look at it now as, uh, you know, it happens. So it happens. So, so I might as well get to tell my own story about mm-hmm. why it happened. Right. But mm-hmm. I obviously met a lot of people, including my wife um, and our moms actually um, met because of this, because of this community wow. and our moms knowing each other um, ultimately is why we got to know each other. And, um, and my wife being the, uh, the savior of my life that she is through, through a lot of the, the times when we, when we talk about how we get to certain places, a lot of the reason you end up getting reflective skills is because you sort of pushed yourself over the edge of the rock bottom theory. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And at the height of like my anxiety and like alcohol abuse and, and, and abusing, you know, other types of drugs. And I was not doing very well. And this is, um, by the way, what I'm saying right here is the first time I've ever really opened up about this to this wow. level. And Thank when you. this podcast comes out, it'll be the first public announcement of the fact that there is a book coming. So that's kind of yeah. cool. And it's um, going to be fire by the way. And, and I'm the guy who told you to do it. And, and I, w- I want to tell that story real quick. So let's do it because we've teased it. So we, we touched down on the fact that Bobby and I met through chess. We started doing chess lessons. Yeah. We're becoming friends. Started it's, sending each other nudes. Started sending each other nudes. It's, it's as, as one does. As one does. Not a, bit. A, not a big deal. Um, and then, so here's the funny thing. So I was in Northern Arizona and I didn't know where Bobby was. I assumed LA. I assume like every celebrity lives in LA, right? Yeah. And then suddenly we end up finding out through like random circumstance that I moved to Utah and you had moved to Utah and we were like 10 minutes away from each other. Crazy. And we had this like this budding relationship, this budding friendship that we're developing. Mm-hmm. We lived 10 minutes from each other. It was fucking wild. Right. Yeah. And then I, so I, I'm still getting to know Bobby and I come over to his house. One and day. I just did my Twitch deal. So I was like streaming chess right. all the time. That's yeah. right. So he was streaming chess all the time. And, and so to tell the story, one of the things that was happening around that time, was the chess boom, the Queen's Gambit, the mm. COVID boom, the Pog Champs boom, where yep. Mr. Logic plays Rain Wilson, right? An <laughs> epic <laughs> match. Um, so the chess boom is happening and I'm I'm becoming friends with with Bobby, but part of the chess boom led to a really weird circumstance where we got reached out to by a documentary film. I won't, I won't mention them by name, um, but a, a documentary company, a legit one reached out and said, Hey, we want to do a documentary about Danny wrench. And we're like, why the fuck, why, why, why do you want to do that? Right. And they're like, well, the chess world's taking off. And we actually know that he has a really crazy backstory. And so I don't know how they knew, but they knew. And we had never talked about this and I, I wasn't prepared to do that yet, mm. but in going through the process with them, we learned that one, they had won like Sundance Film Festival Awards. They were legit. Yeah. So I'm, as you know, I mean, Bobby knows the story, but we're telling it for the first time. I was literally signing the contract to do a documentary with this company. And then what did I say? And I, but I go over to visit Bobby. And again, this wouldn't have happened if we hadn't gotten to know each other and hadn't both accidentally moved to Utah. I said, don't do it, man. So I, I go over there and we're, we're killing a bottle of, of scotch. McAllen. McAllen. Classic Bob. This is a crazy story, right? So we're killing a bottle and Bobby goes, I start telling him, Hey man, I'm going to do a documentary in my life. And Bobby goes, you're not fucking doing a documentary. And I'm like, you can't tell me what to do kind of thing. And he's like, no, I'm telling you, you're not doing that because if you really want to tell your story and if you feel like that is the time for you. You gave me one of probably the most meaningful pieces of advice I've ever had. I really mean that, man. Wow. Like, because you told me like, hey, man, like this world is crazy. And even if they're good people, Hollywood has to fit things into a story arc. They're going to they're going to story arc your life, bro. Mm-hmm. They're going to put you in a in a box. Right. Even if they do a good job. And if you really want to tell your story, you should do it with a memoir. And then it's going to be lit anyway. And then they're going to buy the rights to it. Exactly. Anyway. And that's your IP, your intellectual property. Right. You own that. So I listened to you. And and also because, you know, your advice didn't just come with like a Bobby's opinion. You actually gave me a concrete lead. You you hooked me up with your agent. Yeah. Sarah Pasek. Shout out, Sarah. Love you, Sarah. Boss. We uh, So you hooked me up with Sarah. Yeah. 
I give Sarah a little bit of my story. She's like, oh my God, you got to tell this story. We're going to try to get you Tanner. Yep. Shout out to Tanner. Tanner Colby, an incredible collaborator. He's, he's, he's a really, really amazing guy that, you know, we, uh, as writers, we, we bounce our ideas off him. He really helps, helps us bring up, bring it home, honestly. Yep. So I'm, I, and then the whole process starts because of that conversation and scene. And here we are two years later and I have a book coming out. Which is really cool. And I'm excited. And obviously, you know, people still have to, to wait for that. They think books can, you know, it's like, oh, it happens overnight. Like, no, it doesn't, but it is well worth the wait for sure, especially your story. Um, so getting back into that a little yeah. bit. Um, so you found yourself growing up in this, uh, in this community. Um, yeah. You met your wife and when... Cause you have four children. When did yeah. you, how old were you when you had your first child? So my wife, um, got pregnant when I was 19. Damn. I had my first kid at 20. Maury. More. <laughs> so I'm call Maury. I'm a 37 year old father of four and my oldest is 17. And when people find that out, they're like, they do a double take. Yeah. Right. And they mostly, when they find out I'm from East Mesa, they, they kind of go, Oh, like, well, he's just Mormon because Mormon guys have, mm-hmm. have kids. And then they, then they hear me curse and they see me drink and they go, well, he's not Mormon. So what is going on with this guy? That was funny. Cause that was one thing about my wife. Like when we moved to Utah, she, she's a young mother. She's 21 with a baby. Yeah. And that's like such a unique and special thing. You don't really see that like a lot. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of 21 year olds running around with babies, but you know, to be a young mother yeah. willingly, you know, and, and, you know, we like planned for it. Um, we were blessed enough to have that luxury, but moving to Utah, she was like, it just doesn't even feel special. Like I go yeah. everywhere. There's like 18 year old girls with six kids. Yeah. <laughs> no, like, what? And by the way, nothing wrong with Mormon. Yeah, like, not I, at all. I, yeah, I, most of my, most of my friends are like either ex Mormon or currently Mormon. So like, but it's just funny because they, um, you know, they, a lot of times people assume that, but so I, to answer your question, I had our first kid, um, Nash, my oldest son, um, at the age of 20. Good kid, by the way. He's Good really, kid. yeah, he's super nice. He's uh really smart, man. I appreciate yeah, that. I mean, your Big kid, yeah, your, your two, the, the two boys that I met, like they're, they're so cool. And I'm excited to see them, uh, on tour again, but yeah, please run through the kids. Yeah. So Nash is my oldest. Um, and then I have Warner, my 14 year old yep. and then Hazy, Hazel, we call her Hazy 11. And then Talia is my youngest at seven. Wow. So, and we are done. No more. <laughs> Did you get snipped? I did not get snipped yet. Would I you? Mean, we're just, I, you know, that's a, I don't that know is a, I, do I don't, I don't want to do it because it scares the shit out of me. Like I'm just such a nervous guy. Plus when people find out more about my story and again, I, I don't want to get into more of that. I have some sensitive issues. So I just, I'm not really into getting snipped. And I just, I just don't want to bust ghost loads. Like I'm just scared that, you know what yeah. I mean? Like I really, I don't know. I'm like, I don't know. It just freaks me out. I just, I don't want to get my nuts snipped, you know, I'm, but my wife, she's like, Mm-mm, you got to make that happen. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, hell no, it's not working. And she's like, I'm birthing children. And I'm like, yeah, we'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I understand her perspective. And I feel like if we were going to do one of them, like either my wife have something done or me, I feel like it would, it would be me. Like I would, I mean, I would, of course, need, obviously, but of course. we're not, we don't currently have it. No, that has not currently been done. We're I, just, we've I, made the mental commitment to no more kids. I feel like if a woman gives you her sacrifices, her body to give you children, yeah. it's like, dude, yeah. Okay. I'll cut my nuts off. That's yeah. fine. <laughs> you no. know what I mean? So uh, let me ask you this, you know, as a, as a businessman, I mean, you're literally one of the busiest guys I've ever met. Like you, you, there's always something going on with you. You're always plotting and planning. And the thing I love about it is like, you don't show up to work in a fucking suit and tie. Like everything isn't mundane and, and you know, this way and that way, like, dude, you guys are doing really, really innovative, amazing things yeah. uh, at chess.com. And you are, you know, a driving force behind that alongside uh, an, an incredible team. Um, my question to you is as a father and a husband, how do you balance your time? Oh my gosh. Speaking of watching, watching my breath, just hearing you describe my life was giving me anxiety. <laughs> mid, mid, um, it's giving anxiety. It's giving and giving anxiety. You know that's a term it. these kids are using now? It's giving. It's giving. Oh, it's so. Is that I like a golem it. thing? So like it's precious? I know. Like, that's what I'm saying. It's <laughs> what, giving. What is They're that? just saying things like, I don't know, like, I don't know. Like if, if I walked in and like a, you know, with like, 80s shoulder pads like a kid would be like it's giving thriller well actually they're so young they don't even know what the fuck thriller is anyway it's funny so you were uh your your crazy balance crazy life yeah Yeah. um 
hard for me to answer that question <laughs> without diving a little into the micro, but um, let's get it. Let's micro. I would say I wake up every day. I ex- I exercise religiously. Uh, yeah, I know that. I get so I get my. And it started, you know, my exercise commitment really started like purely out of mental health. Like I was on antidepressants, like abusing alcohol. My my mom, rest my mom's soul, my mom died uh, very young from a stroke. It was very unexpected. And I, having had a very, a very tragic, heartbreaking relationship in general with my mother, it was, it was like the icing on the cake of like a fucking like shit storm of a, like I, I will... I will never make sense of my relation with my mother in this lifetime. I will just, that's why I'm in therapy. So I'm just going to put that over here. Let me just, before but, you continue, I just, I do want to say yeah. that as a kid who's come up in my, you know, with my own, uh, crazy life. You I know, read your book. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, so exactly, you know, mother yeah. and father on drugs and yep. guns in the household and all this other stuff. So many times I told myself like, this doesn't make sense. And other people would be like, this doesn't make sense. And I think, a lot of people try to make sense of it. And because of that, they're almost stuck in this like perpetual uh, repeating pattern, this cycle of depression and sadness because they're trying to make sense of it. Yep. And the fact of the matter is not everything is going to make sense. And I think we as human beings, and I, I, I can say this at least for myself, have, have found that I'm much happier by just accepting what has happened, mm-hmm. understanding that I cannot change it Um, very much so like when I look at my son and I go, how could somebody, you know, smoke cigarettes and abuse me at three years old and do all these things. And I look at this precious little boy and go, I could never do that. But instead of trying to, trying to riddle my brain with why and how and what it's like, dude, it is what it is. And we need to move forward and focus on what we have. I love everything you said, agree with all of it. And I would say, and at the end of that, we have to rechoose it. Mm. You have to have to rechoose your life every day. You have to rechoose your marriage. You have to rechoose what you're doing because otherwise you're literally a victim to the circumstance. And so I would say, I agree with everything you said, and I have to choose I I choose what happened in my life in the, you know, to give myself the ownership Mm -hmm. over the meaning I give it. Right. And what I was saying about my relationship with my mom is that part of losing her, you know, tragically, in addition to other stuff, like had pushed me to the point where I wasn't living a very healthy, balanced lifestyle and getting, you know, getting on top of like my, my mental health started with also my physical health. It started with both. Mm -hmm. Right. And so now it has become, if you want to use the term religious in terms of the fact that I do stick to it. And it's because it really is something that's so core to like how I feel, how I feel healthy. And then also when you have a desk job, like I'm like, you gotta, you gotta like clear your head. Right. So to answer the question, like the balance for me starts with like choosing to do that every day, making that commitment. We get the kids to school and then I, I work and, and, and then do family life afterwards. I don't have many hobbies. That's part of the thing. Besides pickleball, I become obsessed with pickleball. Damn, that's some Mormon shit right I there. Love, I know, but it's fun as hell. It's I awesome. I played pickleball with like 12 Mormons. <laughs> I remember when I moved to Utah real quick. Oh, my bad. When I moved to Utah, I was in this cul-de-sac and there's some really great families there. It was a slight get out vibes, but it was cool though. Yeah. And so we go and everyone's like bringing us cookies and like different shit. And I was yeah. like, yo, this is wild. That's, this that's is like, the, that's the Mormon way. Man. I know, but it was really sweet. But then this one family rolled up and it was like Mormon Wu-Tang clan. It was like nine of them joints, dog. It was wild, man. <laughs> it was crazy. But yeah, suffice to say, we all play pickleball. And then I, I was drinking. Yeah. <laughs> but well, anyway. I, I still, I still drink and, and enjoy life. Um, but I, but I, anyway, I play pickleball. I exercise. I do, I do chess.com and that's pretty much my life. And, so, and then I do the kids, you know, um, for sure. Do you, um, love your work? I, okay. The answer is yes. I do love what I do and I feel a great sense of kind of gratitude in the sense that like, not many people have the, their work as such an extension of what they feel is like their purpose, if you want to use that or something mm-hmm. they have a great why about. Right. Like a lot of the leadership, you know, buzzwords these days are find your why. Why do you do things? And because like you, you make music and and you talk to people. But the why that defines Bobby, you would probably say is actually more like. I, and I don't, I can't speak for you, but it's like, I love connecting with people. Oh, I love sure. being real. Like whatever you would say speak is your for why. me, daddy. That right. is exactly it. So, so I would say like my why of like 
of connecting with people, like reaching people where they're at through something that I think has historically been viewed as like a very hard thing. Like even people who know what chess is, it's over here. Mm. It's too hard. Yeah. And so chess has been a, a vehicle in many ways for me to like put a lot of myself into to like break down the barriers of how the game was perceived and, and break down, break down things. Like my why has always been about kind of like driving, driving with a mission through mm. the game. And so because chess.com is literally the most amazing ending to that as, as a chess player who grew up and kind of failed as a child chess prodigy, basically mm. for chess.com to be what I do. It's like every, do I, do I enjoy every day? Not always. No. I mean, like half the time what I'm doing is I'm writing emails mm. and taking meetings and being stressed out. And like that stuff is not, if you were to, if you were to pound for pound, say, would I rather do that or play pickleball? Like I'd probably rather play pickleball. Yeah. I mean, I can relate on so many levels because it's like, bro, I'm a musician and I love what I do. And it's incredible that I get to wake up every day and make music. But the fact of the matter is I don't get to wake up every day and make music. Exactly. Most of the days are emails and calls and, and I, I enjoy that too. I really do because there, there's, there's something to be said about, you yeah. know, building a legacy, building an empire and continuing to do it, you know, not to toot my own horn, but a lot of people who uh, you know, could, could find themselves in my situation or position would just be like, well, that's it. I made it. I did it. I'm just going to, you know, pit, put my feet up and count my money. Right. I can't do that. There's something right. about the hustle that really does, uh, really does drive me. Um, and, and I feel that, you know, whenever we speak, I, I know how much you care about, um, your company and, and, and this game. And I think that the beautiful thing about chess that I've realized is you, it, it's a game you can't beat. Yeah. That's why it's like the dude, I play every day. I play like 10 games when I wake up, I'll play like three minute games and just, yeah. and it's, it's beautiful. No, what you, what you said really resonates with me. Cause like, I don't know what I would do without the hustle. Mm -hmm. And and part of that is like, I gotta, I gotta be in balance with, with expectations, as long as your expectations are in order. Right. Because sometimes you can be grinding under the thought that it's going to create X and that can be the thing that makes you stressed. If X isn't happening as fast as you want or how you want, Dude. but if you're, but if you're about the mission and you're about like the, the process, then like you kind of don't get stuck on the results. And so every day is good. Right. It's, and, it's crazy. You say that. Cause I find myself in this, like and so, you know, when I came up, I came up in the basement, man. I, I was, I was homeless and my best friend Lenny let me sleep on his couch. And before I knew it, I got a record deal. And back when I was in that basement, I was always like thinking about the next thing. I would always say for every goal I, I attain, I set 10 more. And like, that's a great, that really is a great mentality. But I looked back at 30 years old and was like, whoa, my twenties are completely gone. Oh yeah. And no, I didn't, I didn't like, I wasn't as present as I would have liked to be. However, I did everything I needed to do to get here. And now that I am here, I do the best that I can every day to be as present as possible. I, I love you use the word present because I think that's to wrap a loop on that. Ooh, you know, the, the, Ooh, the, the, the question that you started with about, you know, how do I do my life? How do I balance? Like, I feel like that's like, yo, that, shout out this fucking annoying helicopter. Shout because out to I'm the so helicopter. Good, good timing helicopter. You were saying so. Um, I think being present. You just said that like the whitest guy. Yeah, ever. good time. <laughs> helicopter. All right, I'm sorry. Please continue. Um, no, but I think being present is is ultimately the key, right? Because if you're if you're present, then you know you're you're focused and you're you're appreciating you're appreciating shit. And and I think I think you can't be really present unless you're operating with a sense of gratitude. And I think I will say that one of the things about losing my mom and then, you know, two years ago we went through it all again. Cause then, so I lost my mom at 64 mm -hmm. and then Shauna's mom died at 62, just two years ago in the middle of COVID. So we, we've, we've now both lost our moms over the last five years, very suddenly. And it's been like, it's been hard while business has been doing well. And but I will say this, as much as it pains us to say this, there's no world where we are not better people because we lost our moms. And there's no world that we are not more grateful because we lost our moms. And because if you really embrace the fact that we're all going to die anyway, the gratitude you feel for loss and grief is not something you can fake. And it's, it's not to say like everyone else needs to go through that loss in order to operate with the same sense of gratitude we have. But if you want to be like rated R about this, the honest truth is like your level of understanding about shit goes up when you lose in a meaningful way. And we have, we have experienced this grief together. And I think it makes us more grateful 
for our kids. I mean, the, the fragile reality is as I'm talking to Mr. Bobby right now, my one of my kids could be getting shot at school right now. And I don't know. And when you not not to say that we should be there's a difference between living in paranoia, which becomes mental illness when you're focused on lack of reality. Mm. But when gratitude is keeping you present to the moment, it's like the most I would argue that gratitude is the only real superhuman power. Because we all talk about flying and invisibility, like gratitude is the only thing that actually makes you appreciate your life on on a level that is like it's like a superhuman power is gratitude. Yeah, I think um, I think hardship is I mean, obviously, but it's just it truly is just a part of the human experience, man. Like, how can you appreciate the sunshine without cloudy days. It's just a, it's just a, I know it's almost like, duh, but that what you're saying right now, it really is beautiful. And it's, what does my wife say? Sun all day makes a desert, right? Damn. Sun all, that's a bar. Yo, can she give me a feature on my Whatever you want, man. (laughs) Yo, that is, wow. Sun all day makes a desert. That's incredible. And I mean, but you, you really also, you do have a beautiful perspective on it. And I, I'm sure, you know, that also didn't come overnight. You know what I mean? That came with tears and. Pain. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're jumping past the angry, angry at God, the universe yeah. and every effing thing in the world and heartache and, and the stages of grief are real. Like people, I, I don't even know what they are anymore. It's like, you know, anger and sadness and acceptance denial. and denial. Yeah. And I, I don't remember them anymore, but I, I do know that they are very real and grief sneaks up on you mm. when, when, um, you least expect it. And sometimes a song comes on and you're in tears, wow, you know, and, and that's just the truth. And I think I, I, I want to get off the podium a little bit, but I, what I really mean, feel man? like this is grief, why you're here. This yeah, is your podium, man. Come the on. grief and the gratitude. I think that, that we have has kind of like become our shared experience. Of course, we're both in therapy and we both have our, our bad days and we both, as you said, we met young and married young, had kids young, the experience and that will be in my book and, and you can learn more about it. But the, the gratitude we feel because of the grief has been powerful. And, and you don't get to that gratitude, though, to answer what you said without having the bad days. And one of the things we've learned is that sometimes when the bad days happen, the thing that makes people go crazy is when you fight it mm. and you don't let it happen. And I have now used this phrase as I've given people advice and, and the people who've lost people. And, and, you know, and I've kind of been there. I say, you know, one thing I learned is you have to let grief win because otherwise grief wins. Every once in a while, you have to let the sadness take over your day. Otherwise, you know how it wins? It wins by giving you anxiety. It wins by, by giving you depression. It wins by making you mentally ill. So if, cause here's the deal. If you're sad, it's going to fucking come out whether you want it to or not. It will manifest itself in other forms if you don't let it. Yeah. And so my phrase I've coined is like, you have to let grief win from time to time because otherwise grief wins. Yeah. But that's an emotion. It's healing. It's human. Yeah. We have to go through that. I think a lot of people in the world, they tend to uh, try to pretend like shit doesn't exist or isn't happening or no, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Like they're losing their job and might lose their house. And they're like, nope, everything's fine. It's going to work out. And that's what I mean. Yeah. You can't fake. You can't do that. You know, new age positive mindset. <laughs> no, you can't do that. No, for sure. And, I, but I think, um, you know, dealing with our problems head on is the most important thing, but as a society, we're, we're, we're really taught to ignore it. You know what I mean? Especially now focusing on social media. I mean, it's so easy to get lost in other people's lives just by scrolling on your phone, yeah. um, rather than, you know, dealing with what's going on in, in our own lives. And I mean, even, even as far as comparison, you know what I mean? I, I remember I used to look at artists, um, you know, super underground artists who'd be on a tour yeah. and I'm like a teenager and I'm jealous. And I'm like, one day that's going to be me one day. And then you attain that. But then who are you looking at? You're looking at another artist who's yeah. popping and another this and another that. And, you know, we're, we, we spend so much of our time focusing on what others have rather than truly appreciating what we have. And I'll tell you this, man, from day to day, like, sure, I'm a millionaire. That's cool. Dude, I came from nothing mm-hmm. and I know what it means to have nothing. And that's why I do the best that I can to spread a message of peace, love and positivity every second that I possibly can, except when I'm fucking depressed or upset or this or that, I allow those emotions to be there. I used to be so angry at myself that things hurt. I used to be angry with myself that, uh, you know, somebody on the internet saying something about me got to me or this, that, and a third. I mean, even now as a man, like, dude, I, I find myself not in a crazy way, but I still stress about money and things like that because 
I'm not thinking, oh, am I going to have money in 10 years? I know I will. But what about 20 years? What about my children and their, and my children's children? And I start to freak out about all this shit. And then I'm like, man, look at them flowers over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, man, just chill out, bro. Like, yeah. like you're good. And I think that's important. Uh, one question I have for you yep. is what makes you happy? None. And like, don't give me like the Obama, like my family and my, like what mm-hmm. makes you, you selfishly, just you as a human being, what makes you happy? Hmm. Your kids are healthy. Your wife's hot. That That's all right. Good job. That's yeah. great. That doesn't, we're not talking about family. We're talking about you, Danny. Um, uh, I, again, pickleball. I just got to say it. Yeah, pickle, okay. pickle, pickleball makes me happy. <laughs> it really does. Um, well, then let's let's dive into that. Yeah. Why? What is it about it? Does it clear your mind? It's, it's funny because my answer, the thing that came up for me, and I didn't want to say it, but like what makes me happy is that the end of pickleball, the end of exercise, the end of doing like I get the endorphins after doing stuff. Mm. And I don't know that that's the totally healthiest thing all the time. I mean, I, I again, I. I've been given advice like, hey, Dan, learn to play the piano. Hey, Dan, do something, do something for your mental health that is not about achievement, Mm. that is not about, uh, you know, the end result and the endorphins that come with that. Right. And I, um, I've I I love that on that, you know, the last kind of tangent you were going on, I really appreciate what you said about not judging yourself for like letting a bad comment get to you. Mm. And one thing to compare that for me is like, I've never even been able to like watch a movie without judging myself and how I'm using my time. Oh, wow. That's and, deep. And so now I'm like, what I, what I would, re- what resonates with me is like, what I'm learning to do is to just like give myself some space and give myself some time to like watch a show with my wife and enjoy it. Shout out to Ted Lasso. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fo- football is life. Um, like, but I know that sounds silly, but like people ask me, they're like, you know, and then like, you know, of course everyone's seen game of Thrones. I haven't fucking seen game. Of, I don't watch. I haven't seen I, it. Either. I, I don't watch game of Thrones. Like I don't, I don't, I don't enjoy, I don't enjoy like, I, I don't enjoy my life on like, uh, the way that other people are like, yeah, you, you got to have some downtime. You got to have a show you're watching. You got to just chill. And I don't, I don't do a lot of chilling. Mm. And what makes me happy a lot are the, I think the endorphins of like doing. And I think that I've been very out of balance with that. And one thing I've learned is like, I don't judge myself if I have like a slow day anymore, as much as I used to, I don't judge myself. If I watch a show, I'm kind of learning to chill a little bit in my, like you said, in my, in my kind of. Yeah. But I years. think, I think that's a, I actually think that's a lot deeper than you may think. Uh, Me, myself, growing up um, around such dysfunction um, and trauma, I realized that I find or found peace boring because I was so used to somebody screaming or throwing a cinder block through a (laughs) plate glass window or this. There's always something going on. So I think, you know, even with the birth of social media, I was able to go in my pocket and just kind of not think about what was going on in my life. And I've realized now in these recent years of uh, personal growth and development, especially through therapy, that it's pretty difficult to just sit down with no phone or no podcast. Dude, you're listening you, to, or you, no, you are preaching to the choir. It's man. crazy. I'm, I struggle with that still. And I, and I think I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to work on being mindful about being mindful, like just sitting, like you said, look at the flowers. Right. And, and, and I think that there are, what you said is true. Like it, it's not even just that like peace is boring, but like when your brain is traumatized, it's it's the reason why people will stick in bad relationships because comfort is more important than happiness to a traumatized brain because mm-hmm. the familiar as a, as a kid who like was abused, the familiar, the devil, you know, is always better than the devil. You don't. Right. And you will stay in traumatic, wow, toxic yeah. environments longer than you should. It's why, you know, uh, abusive relationships last longer than they should. It's why it's all the things. Right. And so I relate totally to what you said. And I'm, I was actually just reflecting on this recently in a fight I was having with Eric, my work marriage of 15 years. I've been <laughs> married for, for 17. I've been married to Eric for 15 and, um, chess.com co-founder CEO. And, and we, we sometimes have 
fights where like he kind of has to call me out with like Danny, like you're bringing a lot of energy to this, bro. Like, and we argue every day and that's okay because agreement is not the same thing as commitment. You can be committed to goals and disagree on how to get there all the time in healthy relationships. And so we are, we are the definition of agreement is not the same as commitment. I can say me and Eric, because we have been very different about our, our, our thoughts and things and, but both very committed to doing I think that also makes a great partnership though, because you guys, you you know, I think partnership in any sense, right. I, I believe that communication is literally, the most important thing yep. there is, whether it's a romantic relationship, personal, professional, business, friendship, like communication is absolutely everything. And I think we as human beings, we can have these like really great ideas or beliefs. And when we are challenged by that, the first thing that we do, at least, um, I think especially when we're young is try to combat that and fight it and go, no, this is my idea. Like, don't shoot me down. And, um, one thing I learned growing up is like, no, people aren't shooting you down, bro. They're trying to educate you. They're trying to help you. They're trying to also give you another perspective. And I think that if you can, uh, meet somebody in a calm on, on a common ground, uh, with the utmost respect, even if you think what they're saying is the stupidest shit in the world, (laughs) if you can just shut your mouth and really hear them. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that you have to agree, but try the best that you can to see things from their perspective. I think that makes a wonderful relationship. And I think that's something that you and Eric have, because they only look at what you've built. I think you're totally right. And Eric and I use the, use the terminology a lot when we, we talk to our company. Like we, we have these videos we do once a week called under the green pond Mm -hmm. where Eric and I will just record a quick, like, Hey everybody, how's everyone doing? We're doing this. We're doing that. But like, you know, messages from the CEOs. Right. And Um, but one of the things that has become more important to us as the company has grown, we now have 650 employees, bro. It's a huge company now. Like we have 401ks and dental and, and, and health. Like we are like a huge company and we're, and, and one of our missions and values is, okay, the missions and values of chess.com has been grow and serve, right? Make, bring joy to people's lives through, through the game of chess, grow and serve the game of chess. And now the third one really has become be the best place to work. Wow. And, and what we've done with the mission of, of that has been like, we, we bring that, we bring that out. Cause we always joke that, yes, we, we disagree a lot. We fight a lot, but also like, um, you can always validate someone's feelings and mm-hmm. always validate someone's perspective. Even if you disagree, we like to use yes. And language, not no, but like you can literally wow. disagree with one, someone by saying, yes, I hear you. And here's what I think. And you know what I just said? Like, I literally just said the same thing, like, but I'm going to tell you why I disagree, but I didn't, (laughs) but I didn't say, but, and even when you craft an email, especially when you have a remote environment and you're working and scaling in an async world of Slack and email, it's really important that you're deliberate and thoughtful about how you're coming across. Cause if not, you're invalidating people's feelings in the most impersonal way. Cause they don't even get to hear your voice. Wow. So we really work on like, I will even sometimes delete sentences so that they don't start with words like, while or that said or but because when you say that people read it and emotionally ooh, look at that mike right there they have they think oh he's invalidating what i said okay, so he okay, starts okay. with that but no, yes. i'm just kidding i'm just joking no exactly so <laughs> so you kind of you kind of like you try to eliminate adjectives that are mm. inflammatory and again we don't do it in a perfect world and he and i both yeah, have yeah, as yeah. bad days as any and sometimes you just jump in slack and you're like yeah but the, you're like what is going on here the fact, <laughs> like, but the know. fact that you're aware of that as, yeah. a, as a human being as a professional um it, i mean it's it speaks volumes about your character as a man and i mean you know you're just reinforcing what i'm trying to you know continue to do with my employees and the people that i work with you know i It's like, am I the boss? Yeah. But I don't walk around like I'm the boss Mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, every single person that I work with is so valuable to me. However, every single one of them can be replaced, including myself. Right. They can get another boss. They can go work for another artist. They can this, they can go protect somebody else. But it's like to be kind and use words like even with my assistant, I'm like, I'll I'll text him in the morning and I'll say, Oh, could you please, uh, you know, run and grab some gas and da da da. Or I'll go, uh, you know, may I have a moment of your time? Like, I think it's very important to be as kind as you possibly can. Yeah. Eric is, um, has been super healthy for me in that way because I, again, back to the the full circle of trauma and relationships. Like Mm. the reason I was always more comfortable, like you said, with lack of peace, more comfortable with fighting is like, look, because I grew up around that shit. Like I grew up in a very 
toxic environment with with not really a lot of validating expression to how someone feels wow. a lot more like dominance and power play and abusive kind of language and again alcohol abuse and all kinds of stuff and I, i'm trying to save you know we got i got a big story to tell so i don't want to get too into it but it's 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 a it's a real story of dude your audiobook's gonna be like 20 hours uh, yeah, it's yeah, all good so, don't, um, don't worry about it so what i'm getting to though is like i have I have done a lot of work to try to really embrace that. While I also, be, I believe I was always, Eric and I were always coming together on the level of kindness, on the level of like generosity, on the level of like owning our stories in a way that I think we both had like the same sort of call it whatever the philosophical, spiritual perspective we had about life. But I, I wasn't very good at using simple kindness. Mm. I was, I was deeply kind, but not good at using simple kindness. I wasn't, I was, I feel like I had my More heart was in the right like place. To the point exactly. And, kinda... and, and I think I've really learned to just be a, a softer, more patient communicator and I'm still working on it. And it's been one of the things fatherhood that, has taught me that. Yeah. And oh, I mean, talk about that because especially with, I'll say this with all four of my kids, man, it's been really challenging because you you start to learn too that what works with Nash doesn't work with Warner oh, wow. and doesn't work with Hazel. So shit, le learning man, how to say I'm things. Fucked. My baby's on the way. I'm like, Oh it, shit. It is true because one of the things you learn is you said communication is like the most important thing, right? And yeah. it's foundational. I agree with you. But if the whole purpose of communicating is to connect, mm. then honesty without tact and responsibility mm. to someone's ability to hear it can be cruel and it can actually be invalidating and actually defeat the purpose. Wow. So like taking the time to appreciate that I can't say the same shit to Warner the way I would say it to Nash and expect that that's going to resonate with the result that I want has been super challenging to be like, okay, like, and that's not, that's not a fancy way of saying you have to manipulate the conversation, <laughs> but you have to think about how your words are being taken. And you have to think like, just because you're right about something, saying it dis in a dismissive way to someone's ability to hear you is actually huge, right? And that's kind of one of the things that having for, and now I'm, now I got teenage girls coming up and I believe me, I'm scared shitless. Me and my wife talk all the time, like, oh my God, like, Hazy is going to like challenge us all over again. Cause I just, I just got done raising two teenage boys. I'm not wow. done, yeah, but, I know I, what you mean. but now I got a girl coming in and it's all over again. We learned that communicating things to Hazel is like, I have, I have, I have anxiety. I have anxiety okay. again. Just That's talking okay, about it, man. man. I mean, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be stressful, but it's going to be Woo fun. in this bitch. You know what? But, but it's going to be do? fun and it's going to be challenging. Let's It'll breathe. be an opportunity to grow. Let's do it. Let's just breathe for hey, a guys. second. Okay. ASMR. Inside. <sighs> One more time. Here we go. My wife, I'll show you this one. My wife's really big into this one. It's You're mental health. Vibe. Watch, watch, watch this. You go. I'm just you breathe in and then you do another one. Whoa. And then you breathe out. And the reason she said, just to say with the ASMR, is mm -hmm. that it's the same thing the body does when you're done crying. You know, when you're crying and you're like, <gasps> oh, no. so the reason your brain does that, I learned on an empathy level, is your brain is trying to reset and tell your body that everything's okay. Yeah, or when and, you have a gnarly so, orgasm. <laughs> so when you're, when you're done sobbing, because you just cried your heart out, you go, <gasps> The reason your body does that is because your body is trying to reset your chemical balance to mm -hmm. say, honey, it's going to be OK. And my wife taught me that. So now a lot of the brain science these days is like if you're trying to calm yourself, you go. So you force yourself to do the same thing. So you can do it. The nose is better where you go. Force yourself to take that second small breath and then do a long exhale and it's your body, your brain will tell your body to relax. Well, I'll tell you, I, so I, just, know, I just fucking learned this. Uh, we've definitely gotten to some heavy stuff. I'd like to talk about one more thing okay. before we talk about some, some fun questions and things that I've always been curious about in the world of chess. So you refer to yourself as a child prodigy who failed. Mm. Do you really think that you failed? I mean, obviously I know there's a very deep backstory in all of that, but just for that little boy, why would you say that he failed? Yeah, I appreciate that. I, uh, um, there is, there is kind of a, a big backstory, I think tied into a lot of where I came from and, and what, what path I was put on and the expectations mm. that were on me. Um, and that therefore that I had on myself that I think for a very long time to answer your question, I did. 
Um, and now I think I sometimes joke and kind of say it, but the truth is I don't feel that way anymore. Um, I've also been given advice by my professional guru that I should stop saying it because mm -hmm. self-deprecating mm -hmm. thoughts are not good to keep saying. Right. So I appreciate you calling me out on that because I shouldn't say that I, I failed, but you know, there was definitely, I definitely felt that way. There's a lot to how I feel about my story um, that, you know, that I'm kind of, you know, opening up more and more and talking about with the book, as far as understanding just, just why it was so deep seated, I guess. Mm. Um, but to answer your question now, I definitely don't feel that way. I, I obviously fell into a world that was really interesting with the internet coming around, right? Because we were, remember like at one point the internet didn't exist. Yeah. Right. And so Weird. It's kind of funny if you talk about achieving your dreams, there's a part of me that says like, I literally achieved bigger than I could have dreamed because the manifestation that would be coming with the internet and technology and chess being the perfect product to merge IRL and online. Like think about chess compared to other video games real quick. No matter how good you are at League of Legends, you are not a wizard casting spells in real life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, if anyone watching this show is confused by that, Bars. like, boom, a reality check. You are not a wizard. Also, <laughs> also, let's go to the to the next game that's more comparable. Wizard. No matter how good you are at NBA 2K, you are also not LeBron James. Like, <laughs> let's go. reality check. Yeah, no matter how much you want to comment on Logic's Twitter, you You cannot, are not Logic. You, you don't drop bars really. like Logic. <laughs> let's go. But... When it comes to chess, chess is the same experience over the board, OTB, as the chess world calls it, or IRL, as the kids would say, IRL. as it is online. ASL. And, and so because of that, because it's the same thing, it has it has been a very special experience to see the chess world grow. And it's one of the things we've learned as we've as we've as we've, you know, tapped into younger demographics and just seen the chess boom continue. People don't always think of chess, but once they start playing the LTV, which is our, our business speak for lifetime value, the lifetime value of a chess player is like higher than anything in the world. It's but, crazy. Because when they get in, they, they never leave it. And all the things that we used to have held against us in our early days, chess doesn't have enough animations and chess isn't sexy enough and chess is this. Now are the things that like sponsors are attracted to yeah. because they go chess is family friendly chess is good for your brain and chess is the same game it's the same language you play in in you know africa as you do in the u.s wow. it's the same language and so all of a sudden we actually have a perfect global product that i've learned I, again i'm not just saying this i've learned this from sponsors who've been like also the fact that chess is if anything a great experience on the phone oh, it's is, is a huge thing for I take scale. shits every day. And right. Just, like, so, it's just, yeah. so the point is like, it's, it's become, I know I don't feel like I failed at all. I'm obviously like, you can just hear me. The passion in my voice yeah, about what I do is very real. Sure. I'm so grateful. And, and, and we have such an awesome opportunity, but there was a period where when my chess career as a player fell apart, tied to kind of the spiritual stuff that from my upbringing, there's a reason I was abusing alcohol and drugs, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't feel very good about who I was, you know? So the answer is yes, but no more. And I am working on not being self-deprecating in my thoughts. I think that's a big deal, you know, because, and, and I talk about this, a lot of people sometimes, uh, in, in any space, but let's just say, for example, like a, a friend is trying to pitch somebody yeah. uh, or their friend on an idea or something like that. And they're like, okay, shit idea. But like, wait, first of all, it's like, why would you say that? Yeah. And the reason that you would start your amazing pitch with that is because, um, there's, there's a, a level of like, well, if I kind of like underplay it, mm -hmm. then maybe they'll think it's great. And that's yeah, like, yeah. they're either going to think it's great or not. Regardless, all that matters is, do you think it's great? Right. You know, and, um, we, we tend to do that a lot. You know, we could stub our toe and go, Oh, I'm a fucking idiot. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, it's almost so innate in us. It's like, no, you are not an idiot. You are a human being who makes mistakes. You know what I mean? Professionals make mistakes. I mean, us as human beings, uh, I, I think the fact that every once in a while, while chewing food, we can bite our lip and bleed just shows that somebody who does something perfect 99% of the time can mm -hmm. never do it perfect 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. So it's all good, bro. Like just, just, you know, have, yeah. have a little more faith in yourself out there. Listening. I appreciate that. And you're right. I did learn to lead with like lead with a self-deprecating comment and then say what you mean. Yeah. And one, I learned to do that because of the survival skill of like being an abused kid, but then it became part of my brand. And one of the only things I would not argue against that, or one of the things I've shared with my therapist is to say, yes, I'm working on not being self-deprecating, but to understand one of the things chess.com did to change chess was own the narrative that you don't have to be perfect to play. Wow. Chess is for everyone. 
pog champs is fun. And I, and again, I'll toot my own horn here. I was kind of the face of that because in the beginning, when I was doing chess commentary, I wasn't the intellectually elite, like I've got all the answers yeah. over here. I was the face of, Hey, this is fun. This is hard shit, but isn't this fun that we're doing it together? I agree. This is hard. That, and that's how I felt stepping into the community, you know, especially with my buddy, Joe Bruin, you know, yep. who's, who's, a, who's a great guy. Joe. I love him. Joe Lee. I just call it, we all call him Joe Bruno. Joe Bruno. Anyway, but he, he, I remember like when I got super into it a couple of years ago through COVID and I finally broke 1200, you know, and now I'm at like 16, 1700 and I, everything was about my ELO or my rating yeah. out there. And I was just like, I got it. I got it. And he, Joe would always go, bro, it's just a number. And I was like, no, it's not. I, I'm improving. <laughs> and he goes, you can improve. And it, it, it's, it, it's not about that. And yeah. when I, when I realized that and I stepped back and I was like, yo, this is about chess. Like sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll play, a, um, like I'll go to play uh, the Italian and I'll move my pawn up and then, uh, they may move it. Um, and then I'll take their pawn mm -hmm. and then they'll throw their queen out and then I'll put my queen up and then they'll take my queen. Yep. And then I go, okay, now we're actually playing chess. Yeah. Now I, we're like, out of opening theory. Yeah. And like yeah, we're yeah. just, we're playing chess and, and, and it's, it's actually, it's an amazing thing that has really helped me cope with anxiety. But at the same time, I, I learned that it was also becoming a crutch mm -hmm. because, you know, I'm not on social media and I had to step away from that, but I was always so used to like picking up my phone, picking up my phone. And so now when I do pick up my phone, I'm like, I'd say 70% of the time it's to actually just play a game of chess. Um, but I've learned that even though that is amazing, um, and I may want to, calm down or I might be anxious. I'm still like firing off so many neurons in my mm -hmm. brain, just mm -hmm. doing this. And there is something to be said once again, about just sitting with yourself and thinking about things, you know, because we tend to distract ourselves, but I yeah. will say chess, you know, distracting yourself with chess is a lot better than heroin. So yeah. <laughs> that's okay. Pro uh, tip for the kids. All right. So, question. Let's get yeah. into some fun <laughs> shit. Who is the greatest chess player of all time? Who? His name is Magnus Carlson. He's the GOAT. <laughs> Okay. So you're just like, that's it. Yeah. Well, I mean, so the, the, the Carlson Kasparov debate is similar to the LeBron mm. Jordan debate. Yeah. And it's, it's a real one for a reason because Gary has accolades to his achievements. Um, he was the number one rated player for 20 years. Um, there's also the pre computers versus post computer or pre computers versus embrace computers generation. Mm. And, you know, depending on how deep down the rabbit hole, we want to go and make this a chess podcast. I can tell you that there's, there's a lot of arguments in favor of, because the other person is Bobby Fisher. And a lot of people have always put Fisher and Kasparov in the conversation because they were, they were pre-computers, yeah. which was a different game. Yep. Right. And some of the things they did against their particular generation were so dominant. Right. So sometimes the only way you can rank is like, because we can't actually have LeBron and Jordan play in their prime. We don't have a time machine yeah. yet. So because we don't have LeBron and Jordan in their prime, you sort of do what you can, which is compare stats. But also even if they were in their prime, they're, they're both playing different basketball. Different basketball, right? It's and completely then, different. And who they were playing against and how they had to adjust to be their best was different, right? Yeah. And so until we have a time machine, we can't really answer LeBron <laughs> Jordan but until we have a time machine, I'm not sure we could really answer prime Magnus versus prime Gary. But I think in terms of what I would argue is, is the measurement we've, we've kind of invested in, which is, it is at the core of our anti-cheating technology, but it's also the core of how we measure accuracy by players. And we can say that Magnus compared to the chess gods, the chess gods known as our artificially intelligent overlords, computers, <laughs> Magnus yeah. compared to the chess gods is played, has played the most accurate level of chess that was ever recorded. Wow. And, and so from that level of like just mistake free chess, Magnus is the goat. Dude, I met Magnus at the St. Louis chess club. Yep. Yeah have not washed my hands since I showed <laughs> Like, it was crazy because I was like, I know this dude probably doesn't know who I am or gives a fuck, but I was like, I waited. I like waited outside. Like he he just, he had just played and then he he went into some like other house near the chess club and I fucking sat, I sat outside. I was there and there was like this eight year old boy next to me, but we're both like, oh my God, <laughs> it's like, Magnus. Magnus. And like he comes out and uh, he's, he's, 
you know, goes to say hello to me, but I'm like the kid, man. Say what's yeah, up yeah. to the kid. I, I remember that. Yeah. yeah you, and, you were... then, um, and then I shook his hand and he, and he, you know, he took a moment and I really appreciate that because I also know what that, what that's like as an artist, you know, yeah. it's like if I'm in the middle of a show and I'm performing and I'm this and, da, 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 and there's a fan or someone there who, who really gives a damn. And I know what Magnus means to me. Yep. So I can only imagine like, wow, if somebody feels that way about me, I always want to do the best that I can, especially in a moment where like, you know, shit, he could have just taken an L you right. know, in a game. Right. And it's like, he's like pissed off or whatever the case, but you know, for, for him to still take the time uh, to do that was great. And I saw his dad there and it was crazy. Cause I saw the Magnus, um, Doc, I mean, classic documentary. Yeah. It's like incredible from on the, the Netflix one. Yeah. About or Carlson. Yeah, yeah. Or no, Magnus. It's just called Magnus. Yeah, the one about his world championship match versus yeah, yeah. Fishian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is incredible. But I I, uh, I, I watched that, so I saw like him and his family and how he interacted with all of them. And um, it, it was just really special to kind of be able to meet the man and his father. Yeah. Uh, which was uh, which is pretty crazy. Can you play a game of chess without a board? Yeah. Really? For sure, yeah. I can play. The most I've ever played at once is 12 blindfolded. I played a simul of 12 people blindfolded. No, you fucking did I, not. That's, that's not the world record. The people who can do more. Wait a second, wait a second. You played 12 people in real life while you were blindfolded and you were keeping track of every move on 12 boards? Yeah. Um, there's a video. It's on YouTube. You can look up Danny Wrench plays kids blindfolded. Um, and I'm sitting in the middle of a of a room and the kids call out the, the, the moves and I have to keep track of like, and so there is a system to it where you start with like, it's like rain man. Shit. So I say like E4 on that board, board one. And, and you kind of, you create a visual compartment in your head. Cause I'm facing forward. There's like a U shape behind me as if I'm walking to the board. So it's like E4, D4, Knight F3. It's and then I math. did E4, D4, Knight F3. So like I have a system where I actually knew that board one, and board four were both E4, right? And then what happens? So it actually is hardest in the beginning because in the beginning is when you, when you're, when every board hasn't taken on their own distinct position, their mm -hmm. own original idea. Once you get to the, for me, once you get to the level where every board is original, I go back to the board. I'm like, uh, for a second, it takes a minute, but then you remember. And, um, but I will say this for my level of chess achieved because I didn't reach Magnus's level. Mm. I'm pretty good at blindfold. That's not something that everybody can do. Part of the reason is because my my trainer, who again, a lot of this story in my book, the I, I did a lot of blindfold training as a kid. And so once you kind of like develop that memory, when my wife first, when we first started getting together, she always said I had a photographic memory that was a disposable Kodak. It's not, it's not <laughs> like you see in movies with like powder, you know, but it is, I have, I have a memory for that type of stuff. Did you just make a powder reference? Yeah, uh, first of all, powder, shout out to powder, right? The movie, what? I think you're dating yourself here. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, dude, that's like 92. Dude, I, I, uh. I thought that was a great movie. Yeah. Dude, it was like, pretty, dude gets I, struck I by lightning it. and he like, I haven't seen it in a long time. I just yeah. remember he's just like, he's just the ultimate like pasty. Like he was like probably how like rap sees logic in the game. Like just like the most transparent guy. <laughs> in the world. Um, but wow, that's crazy. So, all right. So you say it's Magnus and you say, and, and you, you yourself know how to, uh, you know, essentially memorize these boards and know, and know what's being played. So you have you and Magnus played? We have, we have, have blitz casual. Have you ever beat him? I drew him. I did never, I never beat him. Damn. Um, you drew him like one of your French girls, Jack and Titanic. Yeah, exactly. I, I, no, I drew him. It was a, it was a tie. It was a draw. It, it was a, a mutual, mutual agreement for peace. But, um, okay. I was no. Okay. Like were we, you hyped though? We, were you oh, like, I did. Yeah, like, take that motherfucker. It, it was awesome because it was actually after an event that he and I did together, like where he was doing Magnus stuff and I was doing commentary. <laughs> Magnus yeah. stuff. And it was, it was a private event. Um, the kind of thing you only do when you're friends with Magnus, because he, when you're, when you're someone like Magnus, he gets invited to the level of exclusive shit where they pay for the exclusivity, right? They don't want it streamed or filmed, right? Yeah, because wow. it's like, this is a private billionaires event with like actors and, and it's like, and, we're going to remember this. Yeah, shit. This so isn't we, about, yeah. So we were at one of those events together and I was only there because I was invited by Magnus to do the commentary. Magnus is going to, you know, play hey, some but people. That's dope. He got you that shit. Yeah. He looked out. He so like, it was cool. So we do this event together and then afterwards everyone's having drinks and we're hanging out and someone had a chess set. So we just started throwing down and the best thing throwing in the world, 
the best thing in the world happened. I drew the first game and probably should have won. Uh, so because that happened, now Magnus is pissed and wants to play a ton of games. Were you on right? time control? Yeah, we were, we were just playing like three minute blitz. Three minute. That's what I, that's my yep. go-to. Wow. That's incredible, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's, I'm not in his league at all. So, but yeah, you but asked. Still, so yeah, you know, I, a- I beat, um, who was it? Who was it? Is it Faruja? Ali Reza? Yeah. Yeah. The kid. Yeah. I beat him once. Yeah. If you, yeah. If you go to my, if you go to my chess.com shit, I beat him. How, well, how did that happen? Time. Yeah. yeah. You flagged him. I still fucking won. I got that dub. He <laughs> somehow in a, another university kicked my ass a thousand times in a row, but I did. And then I met him at the St. At the St. Louis. Dude, that's up. incredible. He could be a future world champion. So there I you know, go. So I could be like, yo, I um, kicked his ass. <laughs> dude, you, you gotta, you gotta remember that one. Cause that's a, uh, last time I was with Ali Reza, he reminded me that when he was younger, we closed him for cheating, uh, because people thought he was, uh, Cheating, which turns out he was just a genius. So, um, but anyway, he, I'm being he, a genius. he did no, not, he did, he did not cheat. So anyway, um, I think that's the thing that I really do love about chess though. It's like, it really like, <laughs> I mean, with the exception of maybe a 400 rating, but I would say like legitimately like eight, 900 ELO and above to me is I, I have just as much fun watching, you know, the professionals grandmasters play like it's just because I, I think I even I don't know if I asked you or if it was Joe but I was like oh is this like boring you know like during pog champs I was like you know it's like here here's you know people like me and rain and rain's an amazing player you know yeah. but but it, you know we're amateurs you know and but I think it's crazy that it kind of doesn't matter your level if you genuinely no. love chess and you have decent players every game is super fun to watch totally agree and pog champs proved that like what matters to make the event enjoyable is that you care about the people playing and that you care about what they're playing. Mm. And like, I think we always kind of knew this. Look at, look at the match, look at celebrity po- pro amps, right? You watch them play golf. If you're into golf and if you care about Tom Brady, right, you watch people play basketball. If you like, you know, if, if they're a celebrity who, who loves basketball. And so I think that chess had just never gotten out of the box. Chess has been so trapped and obsessed with the idea that in order to play chess, in order to be worthy of people watching, you have to be doing it at the best level in the world. And I think that we wanted to challenge that. And I think pog champs show like people showed up to watch logic play rain because they fucking love logic and Dwight from the office. And that's who, and that's what it was. Right. And it was great. And it was awesome. Right. And it was the same with all the, you know, we had obviously a lot of streaming celebrities there. And I think, um, that's really a cool thing because I think we shouldn't, Chess shouldn't have stayed in the box of, of having to only worship those who are the best at it because part of the process of playing chess is what makes it fun. And the part of the process is that it's hard. Okay. But also talking about not staying in the box, like how is it to see people like the Botez sisters yeah. take chess and really, cause I look at those young women and I like, they're killing, like they are literally like streamers like just just like uh, but even more than that you yeah. know they're doing so much more than that but you know you have these incredible people like xqc just some of the biggest streamers in the world and it's yeah. amazing to see these incredible strong young women dominating on a social aspect yeah. in this world like it's crazy how does that feel to see chess kind of go from a bunch of dudes in suits at, at chess clubs to like Twitch and shit. honestly, it's the great, it's the greatest thing in the world. And, yeah. um, like legitimately had breakfast with Alexandra on my way over here. And like, she's just, they're crushing it. They live in LA and they're doing, um, you know, her sister Andrea just did this like boxing thing. Um, yeah, I know. like anyway, which they, they play poker and stuff. Yeah. I, I got to do that. Joe was like, you should go, you should do it. And I, I really want to go. Yeah, you totally should. At some point. I just, I'm not the best poker player, no, but, but I'm for, also for, not the best chess player. So. No, but for the game, it's been, it's been incredible that the, the biggest stars in the game have become people like the Botez sisters, like Gotham chess, Levy Rosman, yeah, Gotham. you know, um, Hikaru is also unique in that he is also one of the top players in the world, but he's really become known for his kind of quirks and personality. Yeah, for sure. Right. Also there's like, not that we need to get into it, but just in general, it's funny how much drama is in the chess. Oh world. man. It's it's, it's kind of crazy. It's we don't D, gotta get into it's it. It's D Rama. I'm just saying. D Rama. It's like yeah. wow, it's kind of like it's like the Kardashians of like. <laughs> yeah, and we don't chess. have to get into it. But this year there was a massive cheating scandal. Yours truly is being sued for a hundred million dollars. Right? There was a there was a <laughs> massive amount of drama in the Twitch streaming community over the last couple of years with copyright strikes and infighting. And if you want to dive into the world that is the international governing body, they are FIDE. They are full of controversies and weird stories and. 
you know, I will say that, well, can I say this from the time uh, the chess world is due its own kind of like documentary and like, you know, like drive to survive kind of behind the scenes stuff. And we are working on this. We are working on bringing this stuff to light because I think one, the stories are fascinating. The people are fascinating. We want to break down stereotypes. If you, you know, chess has been old, slow and white, and we want to prove that chess is young, fun and diverse as fuck. Wow. And that's what we're doing. And, and we want to be like, Hey, let's shine a light on the chess world. Cause it's not what people think. Amen. I love that. And I think, um, I think before we get out of here, Oh, did you want to say something? Go ahead. Hi, Brandon. Okay. Yeah. Brandon <laughs> Brandon's just over there being sexy. Shout out showrunner, Brandon. Um, question where did chess come from? When was it invented? What do we know? How far back yep. does it go? So chess dates back to 600 AD. Um, and it was, That's it was crazy. born out of an evolution of the game Chaturanga uh, or Chaturanga, depending on how you pronounce it in India. And it, it was literally invented as a form of peaceful conflict resolution, which is one of the cool things. If you really want to just appreciate what the game could be as like a symbol of strategic thinking and the things that make the game great, the fact that it was literally born out of a way to like settle land disputes peacefully between kings is actually pretty dope. People don't know that. Then the game moved west, ironically, with Alexander Great and the Persian army as they dominated and conquered and killed a lot of people. <laughs> so Alexander the Great Crazy. brought the game from the east, the Persian army to the west. The game that we play today, modernized and, and the rules that we still use kind of settled around the medieval times. It was actually... Um, Queen Isabella of Spain, mm. who popularized and made the queen the most powerful piece. Until that, the bishop and the rook kind of like shared different powers, but she was the one who was like, no, screw that. I'm making the queen the most powerful piece on the board. So this one woman was like, fuck yeah. y'all. No, in many ways, Queen Isabella is like the most powerful person in chess. At the time, she was probably the most powerful human in the world, actually, you could argue. And there's a lot of, if you know, I've learned about this because I got this question a lot. So I became educated because I wanted to be able to speak Wow. You know, so she was like the Drake of back. In the yeah. She, so she was like, she was like, I dubbed the queen because ladies be in power and that's good. And she's the most powerful. And that's how the game, that's how the game had the queen. And then the last innovation was on passant, which started when they changed the rule, the pawns could move twice. Yes. They invented on passant as a way to kind of counter that. And now I'm probably waging in the weeds, but, <laughs> um, but anyway, that's the history of how the game moved to Europe. And one of the last things I'll cap with that that makes chess special is that chess was really the first game for whatever. I don't know why, if it was just a unique set of individuals who did it or something about because the game had always been associated with high society. Because if you think about it, Alexander the Great brought it west, right? Then Queen Isabella, like it's a really important game. Chess was always associated with I want to say like royalty, the rich and powerful. Mm. And because it was a symbol of power in some ways in strategic thinking, like you didn't have a chess set in like a poor person's home. It like a long, you had chess in like palaces. Wow. And the reason that's interesting is because chess has always sort of traveled with the times and, and kind of been a symbol. And the game itself has kind of evolved with the times. I mean, like, at one point it was a symbol of like science. And then it's like in the industrial age, it was like a symbol of power. And then the cold war, it was literally a grip and a battle between Russia and the, the Soviet union and the U S about who had the smartest people in the world. Yeah. They were racing to the moon, right? They were doing all the shit. And like, that's why Bobby Fischer beating Spassky in this 72 was so big. So chess is just, and then, and then if you go to the nineties, like if I, if I ex remind people, like they don't even remember his name, but if I say, remember the guy who lost to the computer, they oh, go, Oh yeah, the, exactly. So yeah. I, I always say this, you know, you transcended when someone can describe who you are without saying your name. Wow. They can say, who was, that, who was that American? They say, who was that American who beat the Russians? And even if you don't remember it was Bobby Fischer, you know who they're describing. Mm. They say, who was that Russian guy who lost to the computer? It was like deep green and IBM. It was deep blue. But like <laughs> yeah, yeah, they yeah, say yeah, that. Yeah. And nowadays they say, who was that red haired girl who Netflix made a documentary about? Yeah. Was it a documentary or was it real? And everyone kind of knows you're talking about this Beth Harmon character because yeah, 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 yeah. it, it transcended into like modern culture. So anyway, that's my end of a chess rant of just how crazy the game has been. Well, I, yep. I appreciate you for, for going into such depth about that. Um, and I also just want to say, cause I feel like we've only dipped our toes in, into the, the story and the life that, it, that is Daniel Wrench. And I just want to, I want to thank you, um, for your honesty thus far. I want to thank you for your friendship. I want to thank you for being so open and, and talking about things that 
most people are scared to talk about mental health, depression, anxiety, uh, you know, fatherhood, being a husband, what it means to be a working man and doing the best that you can to juggle it all. I am uh, beyond honored to know you and call you a friend. And I am so happy um, that I was able to introduce you to my audience here today. And I thank you. As, and, and I just, I really appreciate you, man. Seriously. Dude, that means the world to me. And I'm going to, not, not going to try to make it too sappy, but I am going to, I'm going to respond with one thing real quick that I haven't shared about the, th- you gave me the courage to do this, ma'am. And I'm actually not kidding. Like, not just because of your push to like pursue my story. And then of course the actual kind of fate would have it logistics that you helped me get on the right path. But then like your memoir mm. and, and seeing like the level of honesty and then like the, you know, one of the times we talked you, you called me and we were just shooting the shit, but like, you could tell I wasn't doing what that way. You were like, Danny, like when did, when was the last time you just like took a breath, man, and just like loved yourself. And like, you have just been like a positive force in my life from the day you entered it. And it's just the fucking wildest thing to me. Cause I've only known you now for like three or four years, but you've just instantly become like an instrumental courageous example. And I really mean that. And it's kind of, it's kind of wild that you just said, opening up about these things. This is the first time I've really opened up to this level, not because I've ever hit it, Mm. but because I, maybe I wasn't ready or the platform wasn't right or the opportunity wasn't there. And I genuinely believe that without this relationship Mm. and without your push and providing the opportunity you did, I don't think I would have done it to the level that I'm now going to start doing. And I can't put in the box now it's, it's out there and I'm, and I'm going to pursue it. You know, my wife is joking about this book that I keep talking about it, man. Like, like she was when she had her first baby. She's like, I was seven months pregnant, still debating whether I was going to have a kid. <laughs> right. And it's like, you just don't even, re- it's going to happen. I, I keep talking about this book. Like, oh my God, am I really going to do this? Am I really going to tell my story? Like, yeah. am I really going to open up and do this? And then she's like, you're already doing it. Yeah, like it's are. happening. And here I am. And so I'll just end that rant with like, thank you uh-huh. for everything that you are and for the opportunity that, you know, you gave me here. And I just, I love you. Dude, I really do. Man. I love and I appreciate you. And, you. And that means so much to me. And I think, um, One thing I'll say moving forward for yourself is continue to do this. Like I was always so scared to be myself. I was scared to open up, you know, especially in hip hop, man. Like, you know, to be this nerdy guy doesn't fit in this, that, like making jokes and being myself and all. Like I was scared for so long to do that. Um, But at the end of the day, you have to be you, do you, even when you're scared to death. Yeah. To do it. And I think you are doing that. And I couldn't be prouder of you uh, at that. And man, you should uh, definitely wake up every day, look in the mirror and be proud of yourself because you and your story, especially through this book, is going to change, help and save lives, man. I don't think you even know what you're yeah, in store it's for. Hard, but it's hard to, to, to really realize that, but I appreciate you so much. And you're the man. Yeah. Anything you want to say to the, uh, to the people out there, any plugs? You, you no, know? You sure? no, man, no plugs. Uh, just being here. Obviously the book's coming out. We already said it all the, the plug of life, you know, what's the, Thank t- you, what's the title? I can't leak that yet because mm. it's not for sure yet. Okay. Um, Right. So, um, is it called, I, I drew Magnus Carlson. I actually think in some publishing space, there is a working title out there, but one of the earliest titles they were doing was searching for Danny wrench, like searching for Bobby Fisher, which I was like, we're not doing that. That's Definitely corny. That, that's do corny that. as hell. Um, but, um, <laughs> anyway, I, I won't say the working title yet, but it's all coming out soon. And I, you know, um, it'll be, it's going to be a wild ride and I can't wait to be back and, and talk to you about everything again, man. For sure. Well, thank you for joining us today. Um, and let's go make out. (laughs) Go team. Hey, what's up guys. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Logically Speaking. Please make sure you click the link and check out more things. Don't forget to subscribe. All those things, things like that. Don't forget. Peace.